In 1970, Tony and Gabriel Watts arrived in PNG as newly qualified teachers, recruited by the New Guinea Mission for four years. They were sent originally to Martyrs Memorial School near Popandetta, about a hundred miles from Port Moresby, where Tony later became head of agriculture, managing the school farm. By 1975, they were already firmly drawn into rural community development in the area and looking to develop many local initiatives. For the Anglican Church there, this was proving to be quite an untried and pioneering approach. But Tony and Gabriel were offered the use of the former Anglican Church Dennis Taylor Farm as part of the evolving project, and it was rebranded as Rural Life Development. They realised that a demonstration farm on site would be ideal for villagers to experience new techniques of agriculture and animal husbandry at first hand and combine training in practical farming skills with the village outreach work. An often heard expression was, Now I have seen it with my eyes, now I understand. One key idea in the original village outreach work had been to take the portable Dolmar sawmill directly onto local land, though it soon proved very heavy and cumbersome to carry any distance into the bush. It did, however, provide great scope for learning and staff training in a very different style of house building. The sawmill was then more permanently set up on site for building much needed new staff housing, including designing and constructing their own home. Large red cedar trees were fell locally and massive logs were brought to the workshop and converted into boards. These were then carefully stacked to season and Tony designed wooden windows to be burglar-proof rather than the metal and glass louvers current at the time. All the timber and roof framework of their house was milled on site and the house under construction was regularly visited by curious local house builders who were intrigued by this different way of building. Having inherited a lot of farm cattle, Tony decided to train up one steer to pull its own cart. Finding a suitable cart was not a problem, as all its parts were also milled and made on site. The white steer chosen was very striking and appeared very amenable to this new tusk, quite new to everyone watching. A good thing Tony had done this kind of thing before. A shame that it didn't always go to plan, though. But the steer appeared ready to go on, whatever happened. As well as rearing cattle, pigs and chickens on the farm, another use of the farmland was to grow familiar food in a different way. While sugar, coffee, peanut butter and flour for baking were already familiar in the local trade store, there was still little connection made with the actual crops grown, nor that they could possibly be processed locally in the village. Pawpaw and banana trees were already familiar, as were local pineapples. Here the lovely golden red sawdust from the sawmilling was used as mulch and compost among these pineapples. Another innovation was the brand new Dong Feng cultivator, much admired, but needing quite a bit of mastering to create straight rows. The new cultivator meant that crops like corn and peanuts could be grown on a much larger scale than before. Peanuts were far more often grown as a snack for eating direct from their shell, while corn at the farm was also grown as chicken feed or for making into cornmeal for baking. Extension work in the villages worked well when there was something to eat at the end of the demonstration. A portable hand-grinding mill could be clamped quite easily onto a firm surface in a village to produce rough cornmeal for baking. While the local youth group was particularly keen to learn more about rearing and feeding chickens. This was proving one of the most popular outreach programmes, which involves supplying baby chickens giving training in chicken husbandry, building movable arcs, feeding chickens, collecting eggs and cooking. 
Another familiar local product was sugarcane, with little connection with the commercial sugar bought from the train store. Short sticks of cane would be crushed to break down the fibres, then squeezed and twisted to release the juice, which after being well boiled could produce a thick, sticky molasses-type sugar. There was also quite a lot of abandoned scrap metal lying around the villages, unable to be used, such as broken knives and axe heads. So Tony built a demonstration bellows at Rural Life Development from old inner tubes to make his own forge. The heat generated through the bellows was sufficient to make useful tools out of old scrap metal, like this knife. He also made a very useful tool for splitting bamboo. Another innovation was a new style sugarcane crusher, which Tony had recently seen in operation in Indonesia. Firstly, suitable timber was rough-shaped into two rounds before being turned on a lathe. Instead of a bullock being used to turn the rollers, there always appeared plenty of volunteers for the job, and it proved a far more effective way of extracting the cane juice, ready for boiling into sugar. Roasting homegrown coffee beans was also an innovation during extension work, even if not everyone was interested. And then the small handmill could be used once again to grind their own coffee to drink. Such were some of the initiatives of Tony and Gabriel Watts, especially in building construction and food production, boosting opportunities for better nutrition in the villages and encouraging self-reliance wherever possible. <laughs>